Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Armourer's Bench. My name's Matt, and today we're going to take a look at one of the most famous volley guns, the knock gun. Commonly referred to as knock guns, the seven barrel volley guns were actually designed by James Wilson. Wilson presented his design to the Board of Ordnance for testing in July 1779. Following testing at the Woolwich Arsenal, the Board of Ordnance decided that the guns, while of no use to the army, might be useful to the Royal Navy. The volley gun's impressive firepower could be devastating at relatively short ranges aboard ships. The Navy had historically used blunderbuss, more musketoon type weapons, and the Board of Ordnance viewed Wilson's gun as an advancement of this concept. London gunmaker Henry Nock was given an order for two seven-barreled rifle guns for Admiralty testing, but these proved to be slow to load in action, and subsequent guns were smoothbore. The Admiralty envisioned equipping first-rate ships of the line, that's vessels with 75 guns or more, with 20 volley guns, while second- and third-rate ships would have 16 and 12 guns respectively, while frigates would carry up to 10 of the knock guns. This represented a sizeable order, and the Admiralty eventually purchased 500 guns, paying £13 per gun, to equip Royal Marines and sailors manning the fighting tops, at the tops of ships' masts. The Navy felt that the volley gun's firepower would be useful when boarding enemy vessels or repelling boarders by pouring down fire on enemy boarding parties. Henry Nock, better known for producing high quality dueling pistols and sporting guns, became the sole supplier of Wilson's volley guns to the Navy. The weapon had six barrels organised around a central seventh barrel, and all of these were of 0.46 inch calibre. They were 51 centimetres or 20 inches long, and all of the barrels were braced together and screwed to an iron plate set into a walnut stock. The outer barrels had vents drilled through them to the central barrel, while the central barrel had a vent leading to the lock itself. Once the flintlock ignited the powder charge in the central barrel, the surrounding barrels were ignited through the other vents. As the vents had to be drilled with the barrels already brazed into place, the outer barrels all have plugged drill holes on their outer surfaces. All seven barrels fired almost at once, producing a significant recoil, which was reputedly able to dislocate the firer's shoulder. According to Howard Blackmore, the service load was originally 2.5 drams of fine rifle powder for each barrel. If my calculations are correct, that's about 68 grains of powder for each barrel, totaling around 476 grains for all seven barrels. Despite the gun weighing 12 pounds, this seems to have done little to mitigate the weapon's recoil, and a reduced load of 1.5 drams of standard musket powder was later used. The Board of Ordnance and the Admiralty granted Wilson, the volley gun's original designer, an award of 400 pounds in May 1780, equal today to about 48,000 pounds or 63,000 US dollars. And after this award, Wilson played no further role in the testing and development of the volley guns. In 1787, the Navy ordered a further 100 guns from Nock. The guns were first used by Admiral Howe's fleet at the Siege of Gibraltar in 1782, and were carried aboard other vessels throughout the 1790s. Howard Blackmore suggests that naval officers, including Nelson, who disliked placing marksmen in his tops, disliked the volley guns. There were some concerns that the wadding from the guns could set the ship's sails alight. Another issue was that it was reputedly not uncommon for some of the volley guns barrels not to ignite, which could have caused issues for double loading and explosions of barrels. As a result, it seems that the guns were seldom used aboard ships and were removed from naval service in around 1804. In 1805, Wilson, then a captain of the Marines, suggested that the Navy reissue the guns to the sea fencibles a naval militia which helped to defend the British coast. However, his recommendation was not followed up. This particular example has the second pattern of lock used on the knock guns, with a smaller lock positioned a little lower on the gun. The earlier pattern used a back action lock fitted high up on the gun, with the front of the lock plate in line with the side of the barrel. The gun has the maker's mark of H knock on the second barrel on the left, as well as various proof marks on the barrels. Unlike other examples, the lock itself isn't tower and GR 
crown cipher marked, but does have the ordnance broad arrow just behind the pan. Interestingly, the steel ramrod appears to have had an extension brazed onto its end. This might indicate that the shorter rod used with the initial service charge had to be extended when less powder was used for the lighter 1.5 dram load. So why did the knock volley guns fall out of favour? As I mentioned earlier, the recoil of the initial service load was significant, and Blackmore hypothesised that there may have also been some weakness to the lock springs, leading to misfires. One key factor is that close quarters fighting aboard ships often relied on edged weapons like cutlasses, boarding axes and pikes. These paintings give us some feel for what fighting aboard a Napoleonic man of war might have been like. A close, chaotic and terrifying affair. While pistols were commonly used, they were disposable and may not have been reloaded during the fight. More likely they were dropped or used as a club. The knock gun would have undoubtedly offered a devastating first volley. And while its 20 inch barrels would have given it better accuracy and range than say a musketoon, how much of an impact a single volley of 732 bore projectiles would have had, especially once the fighting became hand to hand, is a matter up for debate. It certainly would have been time consuming to reload the volley gun. At close quarters an unloaded knock gun quickly becomes a short, ill balanced 12 pound club. The Knock Volley Gun is perhaps best known for appearing in the Sharp series of books and films as Sergeant Harper's weapon of choice, but its first appearance was made on screen in the 1960 classic The Alamo with Richard Widmark's Jim Bowie carrying a mocked up replica, and there was also a recent impressive but fleeting appearance in Master and Commander Far Side of the World. Despite a relatively short and undistinguished service life, the Knock Volley Guns also saw some civilian sales with a number of ornate hunting gun versions, with wooden forends, engraving, rifling and rear leaf sights. Later in 1818, Knox Workshop manufactured a design by Artemis Wheeler, an American gun designer with a fondness for revolving guns. Wheeler's carbine resembles the earlier volley guns externally, but was in fact a manually rotated, self-priming, pepper box style gun, with six barrels around a central axis. Unlike the earlier volley gun, the pepper box carbine was never trialled or purchased by the Admiralty. It's believed that Henry Knox workshops produced 655 volley guns between 1780 and 1788. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this video looking at the knock gun and taking a little look at its history and how it worked. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Sharing the videos with friends really helps us overcome YouTube's algorithm problems. You can also support the channel over on Patreon, and you can find the link to that at the end of the video and in the description box below. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.